So good afternoon. Um, my name is Vince Bonham. I'm the Senior Advisor to the Director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And we are pleased that you're joining us this afternoon. I want to welcome you to the 23rd lecture of the Genomics and Health Disparities Lecture Series. Uh, this series aims to highlight the opportunities of genomics research to address health disparities and address health inequities uh, within our country. This lecture is hosted by the National Human Genome Research Institute in collaboration with our colleagues at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, uh, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, and the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, speakers are chosen by the co-sponsors to present their research on the ability of genomics uh, to improve the health of all populations with a focus on issues of health disparities and health inequities. The speakers in the series approach this problem from different areas of research, including basic science, population genomics, translational, clinical, and social science research. Um, today, um, uh, Dr. Rear Admiral Sharde Arojo, who serves as the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at the Office of the Commissioner at the U.S. Food Drug Administration will introduce our speaker, Dr. Orojo. Thank you, Vince, and good afternoon, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to be here with all of you today and to have the privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Emer Kenny. Dr. Kenny is the founding director of the Institute for Genomic Health and Associate Professor of Medicine at Genetics at Mount Sinai. She is a statistical and population geneticist. She leads a multidisciplinary team of geneticists, computer scientists, clinicians, and other medical professionals working on problems at the interface of AI, very large scale genomics, and medicine. Her goal is to accelerate the integration of genomics into clinical care, particularly in diverse and underserved populations. She is also principal investigator in six large international programs focused on genomic research, medicine, and health, and is in the top 20 of NIH-funded genomics researchers in the United States. She is a scientific advisor to many genomic and genomic medicine initiatives across the government, nonprofit, and industry. And she has extensively published over 90 papers in leading journals like Science, Nature, Nature Genetics, and New England Journal of Medicine, with over 13,000 citations. And her work has been featured in many media outlets, including the New York Times. She received her BA in biochemistry from Trinity College Dublin, her PhD in computational genomics from Rockefeller University, and her postdoctoral training in population genetics at Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenny. Uh, so thank you very much, and thank you for that warm welcome. Um, thank you very much to my hosts at uh, the FDA Office of Minority Health and uh, at NHGRI, um, my, uh, I think, uh, NH NIH home, I think. Um, so before I start my disclosures, uh, so I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time today um, for this talk uh, looking back at our field and how far it's come in the last uh, 20 years, I think there has been huge leap forwards in terms of technology um, and uh, in the ways in which we've come together as a global community of genomics and how that has impacted genomics, not just in research, but also in medicine and, and actually in society. Um, and uh, because I'm uh, here giving a talk virtually at NHGRI today, I really wanted to uh, give a nod to uh, the important birthday that is coming up uh, and a historical perspective of the field of, of human genomics. Uh, so um, about 20 years ago last summer uh, was released the first draft of the Human Genome Project, uh, the back-to-back -back papers of which came out in uh, 2001, I think it was February 15th, and that really uh, was an enormous landmark achievement for humanity. And at the time, many people put their bets on what the future of human genomics would look like. Um, I don't know if anybody would have predicted where we are today and how far that we've come. 
So in the subsequent two decades, as a field, we've generated vast, vast databases of uh, variants of human genomes um, and catalogs and tools for the community to use, often open source and publicly available or available to researchers, communi research communities. We've surveyed the sequence variation and the genome structure of uh, humans all across the world. And we've done this in a way uh, where we openly share methods, we openly, uh, to the best extent we can, uh, with, uh, sh um, share data and we foster relationships um, uh, these days, not only thinking about participants and researchers as samples, but as real partners in, in research. And this is particularly um, being through the emergence of global biobanks and community partnerships. Um, just last year, there was launched the Human Pan Reference Genome Project, which is can be seen as a, a successor to the Human Genome Project in that it's, it's leveraging what have been just in dramatic improvements in genome technology just a month or so ago, the first end-to-end -end diploid phase human genome was uh, generated. Um, and now uh, the endeavor is to generate those for 350 diverse genomes around the world for our reference genome so that the scientists of the future will be using tools um, that look very different from the tools we use today. Um, so it really is true uh, that genomic technology is creating our biggest databases of knowledge. Just last year at the AGBT conference, um, around this time, Illumina announced that uh, 150 petabytes of data had come off their sequencers that year. And uh, I was at that conference and I saw that number at the time, my eyes went really wide. So I went to the interwebs and I thought, well, what other um, entities are generating uh, data like this? And if you uh, go online to YouTube, they announced that they generated 693 petabytes of social media database in 2019. Um, if you look at reports from other large research efforts, like, for example, um, folks at the large um, Hadron Collider in CERN, they generated 25 petabytes of uh, data in 2019. So uh, genomic data is, is really becoming um, uh, one of our biggest types of data we have in the world. And, and really what that means is that um, the, the opportunities uh, to think about how we learn from that data and utilize that data for, for good in uh, medicine and in society are, are, uh, are really exploding. Um, and not only that, but we're really getting to numbers in terms of assaying the genomes of humans um, in numbers that are topping hundreds of millions. So we really are getting to a point in our field where we are uh, uncovering genetic variation in a, a considerable slice of humanity. Um, and and of course, not only are we uncovering genomic variation, but often we link that to information about outcomes about disease, about cellular phenotypes, tissue level phenotypes, um, organismal phenotypes, not only in medicine, but also in anthropometry um, uh, for uh, biomarkers, uh, for um, lots of different diseases and traits. And uh, here's one of the databases. Um, it's also an EHGRI and uh, EMBL supported database called the GWAS catalog, uh, which is a repository for information from genome-wide association studies uh, that have uh, been uh, since their inception back in 2005 um, up until uh, today in 2020, uh, that these days has grown to uh, represent uh, hundreds of millions of participants, but also broadly over 3,000 diseases and traits. Um, so uh, it's a very exciting time to be a researcher in human genomics. And uh, the outcome of this is that we have seen genomics uh, come into new arenas, certainly in medicine, um, uh, not only in, in terms of diagnostics and family planning, but also into new arenas of uh, preventive health and pharmacogenomic. And of course, you as a citizen can take your credit card and, and uh, go to a company as a consumer and, and um, get your genome sequenced or genotyped. 
Uh, but with these exciting technology and the growth of knowledge and databases come some challenges that I think we have to face. Here's one of them that is the focus of my research, which is that genomics is failing on diversity. And by that, what I mean is that the enormous databases that we have built in the last two decades that are the engine of data that we're using to drive discoveries and knowledge that we're bringing into um, uh, other arenas are biased in their representation of humans on the planet. Uh, so taking the GWAS catalog as an example, uh, but really you could pick any database as an example, it looks very similar. Um, about 80% of participants in the GWAS catalog are from European ancestry populations, actually specifically usually from Northwestern European ancestry populations. And there is underrepresentation or even lack of representation sometimes from many other populations and places on the planet. Um, so, um, so I want to actually uh, 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 talk a little bit about what this uh, impact of uh, this bias in our knowledge bases has meant and I want to walk us through some examples um, uh, from genomic medicine and bring us into um, examples in uh, the um, uh, knowledge of common disease and, and even the future of uh, preventive health. Uh, so one of, uh, or two I should say, of the genes that are possibly two of the most characterized genes in the genome, which were discovered back in the mid 90s are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes uh, that were discovered because of their, um, uh, because uh, carrying a pathogenic variant in either of these genes puts individuals at risk uh, for breast cancer. Fast forward about uh, 25 years later, we actually know a lot more clinically about what is going on in individuals who harbor a pathogenic variant in one of these genes. Uh, we know about this not only now in terms of average lifetime risk, but also within uh, different age groups and uh, not only in women and for breast cancer, but also in men for breast cancer and for many other cancers like ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and melanoma. But quite shockingly to me, um, at the time that um, we wrote a paper last year that came out in uh, Genome Medicine in 2019, uh, led by Nora Abelhassan, who's the co-director and clinical director of uh, the Institute for Genomic Health, uh, even though we had uh, know, knew so much about these genes and variants in these genes, we yet didn't know a lot about them in a, a diverse populations. Uh, so this was something we could remedy by looking in diverse populations in New York City and, um, and uh, cataloging uh, the prevalence of BRCA1 or BRCA2 variant positive individuals in different populations in New York City with recent ancestry um, from different countries in the world. And in doing so, we found that uh, there are quite a, there is quite a difference in the prevalence of harboring a BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation in different populations that ranges from about one in 50, particularly in Ashkenazi Jewish populations due to um, well-known founder uh, mutations in that population to um, one in 500 in, for example, um, populations from the Dominican Republic. Um, but actually, um, one of the more uh, uh, shocking things about that study was that 74% or three quarters of people who harbored a variant positive uh, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation were unaware of the cancer risk that they harbored. Um, and so that says that even though uh, we have learned a lot in research and, and hopefully uh, increasingly we'll learn a lot about risk across diverse populations, um, that information is not actually getting into clinical care um, as, as much as we would like or as quickly as we would like. So that has really led, I think, to a lot of interest and in investment into um, uh, uh, generating genomic data within health systems for the study of how we translate findings from genomic work, work and implement them in clinical care. 
Uh, this was uh, something that really brought me back to New York City as I was finishing my postdoc and I was looking for faculty jobs. Um, as a population geneticist with these interests, New York City just seems like a place to be, uh, a canonical melting pot of uh, the US that's really representing not only uh, diversity uh, of uh, populations in the US, but also uh, from around the world. Um, so uh, New York City is, uh, is about his five historic boroughs of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Manhattan. And if you divide that into um, the 70 or so storied neighborhoods of New York, um, then uh, you can uh, paint those neighborhoods different colors based on the majority of a particular population group uh, living in, in, different pop in different neighborhoods. And this is using data from the US census from 2010, hopefully soon to be updated with the 2020 census. And what you can see in New York City is that the neighborhoods are very colorful, representing neighborhoods that are um, the majority Hispanic, white, uh, black, or Asian, or in purple uh, neighborhoods that are um, uh, have no one majority population group. But that's only one way to look at diversity in New York City. Another way to think about diversity is in terms of uh, people's stories and their heritage and their experience and their families and their ancestries. And this is the topic of a website called Humans of New York that I, I recommend uh, to anyone if you're interested, where the author just walks around the streets of New York and meets people and asks them questions about themselves. And in those an anecdotes and stories, you learn a lot about the rich cultural history of New Yorkers and their ties to New York City and also beyond New York City where they or their family may have come from. Uh, so um, in the uh, School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, we have uh, established a biobank, uh, which is a repository of DNA. And this was established in 2006. We started recruiting in 2007. And it really was a lot of foresight on behalf of leadership in the hospital to understand early on that many of the databases that were growing in the field of human genomics research may not be represented representative of the patients that we are serving in the hospital. And therefore, it was worth making an investment um, to develop our own resource for linking genomic information to health outcomes and driving research in diverse populations. So today, there's about 60,000 participants enrolled in uh, the Biome Biobank. It's more or less a population-based biobank. There was a little bit of ascertainment for particular diseases in the beginning, but um, after a while, it was actually um, more or less the only inclusion criteria is that you are a patient in Mount Sinai Health System. At this point, uh, we've uh, generated through both grant funding and uh, industry partnerships, uh, sequence data, whole genome, whole exome, and array data for approximately half the participants with um, another tranche of data due actually uh, next year. Um, at the point of enrollment for the biobank, we collect census level data that includes questions about uh, people's personal and family uh, health history, but also questions about um, uh, people's uh, ancestry and uh, self-reported uh, uh, identity. So that if we take that information and we ask about the diversity in the biobank, uh, we can see in the Biome Biobank that about 36% uh, of participants are born outside mainland US. Uh, this is not unexpected. It's very consistent with uh, the denizens of New York City. And if you go to nyc.gov and you see similar um, statistics about uh, the demographics in New York City, and you can see by painting different countries in the world where people were born that there is quite a lot of representation here uh, with particular enrichment for um, people who were born in areas of the Caribbean. And if you go back two generations, so uh, Biome participants or three or more grandparents born outside the US, uh, you see that that patterning gets even richer. About 65% of participants have recent ancestry from somewhere else in the world. The patterns change a little bit because of course now we're going back in time to approximately the beginning of the 20th century and world events that were happening at the time. Um, but you can see that um, uh, there's about 160 
60 countries uh, in the world represented uh, here in terms of um, ancestry and uh, recent country of origin and stories of diaspora migration uh, to New York City. Now, if you think about that from a genetic lens, uh, then you start to see another lens upon ancestry. And this is a tool that we use in population genetics a lot. It's called a principal component analysis. And we're looking at this data on two dimensions only. In fact, the data really is very, very multidimensional, but uh, visually that's hard to see. So we look at it first on two dimensions. And every dot here, it represents the genome of an individual. And the distance between any two dots uh, represents simply how similar or dissimilar the genomes of individuals are to each other. Um, and we use this as a tool in population genetics to then make an inference about genetic ancestry um, of uh, participants. And to help us out here, I've also in colors um, uh, included uh, populations from Africa, from seven continents, Africa, Middle East, Europe, South Asia, Oceania, um, East Asia, and the Americas. So straight away, I think you can notice something very striking, and that is uh, there is, a, at least in New York City, genetic ancestry of New Yorkers is represented very much on a continuum of genetic diversity uh, that is uh, really overlapping with ancestry from seven continents around the world. And at least in genetic ancestry space, it is very hard to uh, divide people up into distinct uh, groups. Rather, uh, what we're seeing here is a continuum of genetic ancestry that is very consistent with our history as a species and our origins in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and our migrations uh, throughout uh, almost everywhere in the world so since then. One of the interests in my group is to also think about ancestry, not just in more ancient uh, context, but in very recent context, particularly in the types of um, e personal experiences and migrations and family stories people have about um, their uh, uh, migration to or through New York City. And so we use a tool in genomics uh, called um, uh, uh, Identity by Descent Sharing. So um, this is basically where uh, you may share long haplotypes of genetic um, of your genome identical with an ancestor who may be cryptic to you in your history by virtue of being separated by five, 10, even 50 generations, uh, but with whom you still share um, uh, identical tracks of genetic ancestry. And, and for the most part, these are people uh, walking around in a population that you may not know you're cryptically related to, uh, but we can pick this up genetically. And what this tells us a lot is about, at a, at certainly at a population level, is about more fine scale um, uh, demographic events, for example, like bottlenecks, like um, patterns of endogamy, uh, patterns of migration, patterns of admixture. And one of the interests in my group is really to understand how this uh, recent population structure, particularly as in the, it, it coincides with an era in human history where we have really accelerated intercontinental travel and exploded in our numbers on the planet, how all of these factors can actually impact uh, diseases and health outcomes. So to do this, I'm, I won't go into too much detail because this paper was just accepted in Nature Communication. It's also up in BioArchive. But just to let you know, these types of methods involve a lot of um, kind of heavy lifting in the in software engineering side. And um, so we had to develop a method called eyelash using locality sensitivity hashing to allow us to detect um, IBD at a population level for every pair of individuals in BioMe um, a, a, in reasonable time and this is work that was led by uh, Ruby Shimarani and Jillian Belbin and uh, uh, with colleagues uh, Jose Ambi uh, Luis Ambient and Christian Yu. So um, if we detect 
uh, these distant uh, signatures of cryptic relatedness at a population level in New York City. And then uh, we use uh, community detectors to find communities of people who have more IBD sharing within the community uh, than between communities. And then we correlate that with information that we know about recent country of origin or cultural or um, other types of population group labels, then it turns out that this way of detecting recent history and demography in New York City is highly correlative uh, with um, uh, uh, country of origin and uh, different uh, population groups. Uh, so, for example, you can see that we can detect with, with uh, quite good accuracy um, people of Puerto Rican ancestry or Puerto Rican versus people of uh, Dominican ancestry or people from the Dominican Republic. And this turns out to be important if you're interested to understand if there's particular health um, uh, outcomes that are enriched or sometimes even depleted, so being protective in those communities, uh, particularly when these are understudied. Uh, so this was something we did by linking these communities to uh, the health system data and repurposing uh, billing codes, so ICD-9 codes for research. So we, this data is not data that's collected for research, but you can be opportunistic and uh, link this data because it does carry information about the health of patients in our, in our health system and use it for um, discovery research. And, and we used an approach called uh, phenome-wide association. And uh, we looked for uh, ICD-9 billing codes that we had collapsed into something we call fee codes that represent diseases uh, that might be enriched in, uh, in this case, in the Dominican community and not so in other communities. And straight away, we found a particular cluster of these fee codes um, that were highly enriched in Dominican populations. Um, and this, this fee codes encoded a number of codes that um, were uh, peripheral artery disease or related to uh, peripheral artery disease. So for those who don't know, peripheral artery disease is a narrowing of arteries uh, that um, reduces blood flow to uh, peripheral arteries or limb. Um, it's usually caused by atherosclerosis and it's usually a downstream effect of atherosclerosis. It can cause uh, pain uh, that's um, caused by compromised uh, blood flow and the progression of uh, this condition can lead to uh, things like ulcer, ulcers or even uh, amputation. Um, but much like atherosclerosis, there are many interventions for this disorder, including things like um, statins. So, but of course, we don't know that there's necessarily a genetic component to why we're seeing an, an enrichment of peripheral artery disease in uh, populations from the Dominican Republic, because again, we didn't collect this data for research, it's just health systems data. So there could be lots of reasons. There could be something environmentally going on, something societal, there could be things like uh, issues of health access or where people are getting treated. Um, so we uh, uh, try to rule in or out uh, what might be going Going on. Certainly, we did not find anything previously published in the literature to suggest um, that uh, this might be a disorder impacting this population um, at uh, increased rates. Uh, so uh, we decided to apply some genomic approaches that were really tailored uh, for the unique history of um, admixture that occurred in, in populations in the Caribbean, uh, particularly in the Dominican Republic. Uh, so due to the history both of colonization um, of indigenous populations that uh, were living on the island and through uh, the slave trade that, that very much came through these parts of the Caribbean, um, antecedents to today in the Dominican Republic or living elsewhere in the US but with ancestry from the Dominican Republic uh, share that history in their genome in terms of genetic ancestry. Here's one way of looking at, at the bottom of the plot. Uh, this is called an admixture analysis, uh, where each bar represents a genome. And you can see that uh, in populations from the Dominican Republic, individuals can harbor African and Europe 
a European and Native American genetic ancestry, uh, but at different rates. And in fact, you can almost tell that no one person is exactly the same as, as another. Uh, uh, individuals can be uh, have high degrees of African genetic ancestry or low degrees of African genetic ancestry. And just to show you, uh, looking at other populations in the Caribbean, you get similar uh, patterns, but slightly different depending on different population histories in, in islands in the Caribbean. So that uh, feature of admixture allowed us to uh, use a method that actually is um, a method that's been around for a couple of decades. It fell out a little bit of favor in the, in the era of uh, GWAS, where we're very much looking at SNP-based association. Uh, but this is a haplotype-based association um, that uh, leverages the ancestry um, along a genome. So if we look at admixture in the, Caribbean, in the Dominican population, on average, um, individuals have 40% uh, uh, African ancestry, 50% European ancestry and 10% Native American ancestry. However, if you look at the karyotypes of individuals, and in this GIF, uh, this is cycling through, I think, um, uh, 20 different individuals, you can see at every diploid locus of a given chromosome um, that that ancestry, that haplotype itself may come from um, uh, Africa, Europe, or uh, the Americas, and uh, and any any uh, any given individual may have a different haplotype at any uh, at a specific locus. Uh, so uh, we uh, leveraged that um, uh, uh, feature of genomes in the uh, Dominican uh, population to perform admixture mapping. In other words, that's uh, similar to SNP-based mapping, but also including uh, the local ancestry inference of African, Native American, or European ancestry at the locus. And this work was led by Sinead Kulina and uh, Jen Wojcik. And uh, sure enough, we found a, a signal um, on chromosome two that was shared predominantly in um, uh, the Native American and uh, European tracts of uh, admixture in the populations. And this was at a locus that includes the fibronectin 1 gene, uh, which, is, uh, which had been previously associated with vascular thickening and has uh, been observed with ex increased expression in uh, different um, aortic valves and, and other vasculature. Uh, so this particular uh, 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 variant that was fine mapped to this locus uh, is a very good candidate as a, a variant that's enriched on the background of um, uh, European ancestry in Dominican populations that is linked to peripheral artery disease in those populations. And the other thing we can learn about population structure um, is also about um, uh, founder effects. In fact, we learned to our surprise that there are many um, uh, fine scale populations in New York that exhibit signatures of founder population. Maybe it's not so surprising because founder effects occur at, through the process of migration itself, in addition to other processes of cultural endogamy or in, sometimes in, in isolation. But from a genetics perspective, this is interesting because, of course, uh, after a bottleneck, there is an increasing chance that a, at any given um, uh, Mendelian SNP might uh, arise to appreciable frequency in a founder population where there has not been enough time yet for purifying selection to select it out. And indeed, we found that was true. So uh, when we looked in uh, the Puerto Rican population that um, harbored a founder effect, uh, we discovered a mutation in the COL27A1 gene that in a recessive state is uh, causal for uh, Steele syndrome. Um, this had been both described clinically previously and then uh, the molecular uh, etiology of the disorder was um, discovered through clinical sequencing the year before. 
Uh, but now that we had that information, we could link back to our health system data and start to look at the clinical characteristics of the disease. And sure enough, in the five individuals who were recessive for this uh, variant, um, if we look in their medical records, they exhibit very similar clinical features, including congenital hip dislocation, extreme short stature, and uh, things like cervical spine anomalies and uh, large joint replacement before the age of 50. And uh, at the time we published this work um, in a paper in eLife, and this work was led by um, Gillian Belbin. Uh, but now that we had uh, data uh, actually linked to a health system, we could go a little bit step further and explore and clinically characterize what was going on in this variant. One of the things that we were particularly interested in was whether this uh, disease was fully recessive or perhaps there might be a, a semi-dominant or a heterozygous effect. And uh, certainly this was important because although only five people carried both copies, 170 people carried uh, one of them. And so when we did a feed, a few was, sure enough, it turned out that if you uh, even carried one copy of this uh, variant, uh, then that was associated with other uh, spinal and uh, joint anomalies and uh, uh, clinical experts who went in and did a careful a manual chart review in individuals below the age of 55 um, uncovered that uh, uh, harboring even one copy of this uh, mutation uh, resulted in spine degradation ranging from severe, almost as severe as in the recessive state, um, to moderate, um, uh, to asymptomatic or at least asymptomatic in, in that we could detect. Um, so this um, further clinical characterization of this variant uh, uh, really unhelped us understand uh, what might be going on. In fact, uh, based on this research, we think that the single variant drives spine and joint degradation in upwards of 2% of individuals with Puerto Rican ancestry. And we could tell this by looking where in the world this variant was segregating. Um, and, uh, and this was exciting also because uh, working in a hospital, uh, this didn't just stop with a research finding. We could cross the hall and talk with our clinical colleagues and think about points of entry to a health system where um, uh, kids with, who were born with this order might come. And we worked with colleagues in pediatric endocrinology and orthopedics who might see uh, uh, children with uh, severe hip dysplasia. Um, we also talked to our colleagues in the medical genetic testing laboratory at the time, which is now spun out to a company called Semaphore. And they, based on our evidence and emerging evidence from the clinical literature, uh, developed a test uh, to diagnose this disorder. And, um, and now uh, patients who come in through uh, this system can uh, be referred to medical genetics for uh, diagnosis of this disorder. Um, and uh, this is an example of a, a syndrome that uh, was uh, very fairly understudied and undercharacterized in the literature uh, that is much more prevalent than previously thought and much more um, nuanced in its clinical characterization and certainly uh, very underdiagnosed if our health system is an example. Uh, we did search the, the notes and clinical records for any mention of anybody having a diagnosis of uh, Steele syndrome and we uh, could not find any even though there must be, based on numbers, hundreds of individuals of Puerto Rican descent in our health system who have this disorder. And as we sequence uh, more and more humans on the planet, I think uh, we're going to see uh, this more and more about uh, variants, um, uh, uh, Mendelian variants, in terms of understanding what they're doing at a population level, um, uh, understanding that they're probably uh, in some cases more prevalent than we had previously appreciated. Um, maybe not always as penetrant as we had uh, thought based on our ascertainment of severe clinical cases, but sometimes and un usually undertreated, even when there are, for some diseases, good therapeutics existing. Okay, so in the remaining time, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, moving from genomic medicine into thinking about uh, 
preventive health. Um, and come back again to the GWAS catalog, because of course, one of the things that's happened very recently, just really only in the last couple of years, is the GWAS catalog has achieved a size uh, that has reached that sort of tipping point in terms of um, uh, predictive ability, where uh, uh, genomic discovery data can now be used to predict out of sample uh, for those outcomes and diseases and disorders. But again, we're still um, in this situation where we know that the genomic databases are, are biased in representation. So a couple of years ago, uh, uh, one of, uh, and this is work led by Alicia Martin, who was a grad student at the time in uh, Carlos Bustamante's lab as I was a postdoc there, uh, we posed the simple question, uh, does this bias in our discovery genomic databases impact uh, our prediction of these outcomes and traits in diverse populations? And uh, in this paper that was published in uh, HHG in 2017, uh, we showed by looking at this using the thousand genomes data that if you naively take a polygenic risk score, at least the ones that were available to us around that time, and you um, predict uh, the trait in non-European samples, um, that those predictions are actually uh, quite biased and so for in this example, I'm showing you height, uh, where if you take a, a, a PRS for height that was generated using predominantly European populations, it would predict that all non-European populations are shorter than European populations. And of course, that's not true at all. There is a lot of variation in height in humans on the planet, uh, but it's not uh, organized by continents at all. And average across continents, height seems to be very similar uh, around the planet. Um, so the empirical phenotype evidence does not support this observation in uh, risk prediction, which led us to um, conclude at the time uh, that the differences in polygenic scores um, uh, were reflecting a technical difference rather than true biology, and that we noted that the prediction actually decays with increasing genetic divergence between the, the uh, discovery population and uh, the target population. And at the time, um, we concluded that neutral human evolution was sufficient to explain these differences. In other words, differences in neutral variant frequencies and neutral and uh, LD architecture between populations was really um, what was uh, driving these differences. And, and since that, and uh, another paper at the time that came out from David Balding's group in London, I think many, many people now have uh, are doing research in this arena. And it turns out that our simple explanation probably isn't sufficient by itself. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But of course, when we think about predicting uh, using genomic data in two samples that were not part of that study and that we're using that as predictive value, we have to also consider things, other things we know in genomics. So for example, uh, selection and, uh, and the impact of non-genetic factors like the environment, particularly for a species that has so much exposure to so many uh, different environments around the world who lives in a very complex structured society, um, that, that these things will also come into our ability to predict. So here's a very good example of that. Um, and I'm biased here because it also was a project that I worked on in which we uncovered a, a variant in a gene called TYRP1. Again, in a recessive state, this actually has a, a big impact on a hair color in populations from the Solomon Islands in Melanesia. Uh, in fact, in two copies, it explains about 50% of the variance in hair color. And uh, as you can see, in this photo here, um, this child has beautiful blonde hair as a result of harboring two copies of this variant. Um, and at the time, we went looking for it in databases for, from Europe uh, because one um, theory might be that this was a variant that uh, traveled to this part of the world in uh, some of the early days of uh, uh, sailor ships that came from Europe to um, Australasia. Uh, in fact, we showed in that paper that we didn't think that that was the case at all. We couldn't find it outside of the Solomon Islands at the time. Um, and we showed no evidence that this had a link back to European genetic ancestry. So we concluded in this paper that this was a variant that arose independently uh, driving blonde hair in the Solomon Islands, maybe even before there was blonde people in Europe. Um, to my excitement, uh, uh, last year when the first tranche of um, 
UK Biobank Exomes was released and, uh, you know, there was a number of blogs about the initial findings, it turned out that uh, the same missense variant also occurs in white Britons in three copies out of 50,000 individuals. So very, very rare. Um, and it by itself was not strong enough observation to make a link to a phenotype, but in uh, aggregate with other missense or pathogenic variants in that gene, they were linked to uh, blonde hair. So I point this out because uh, that particular variant, uh, which um, most likely is a, um, a variant that reoccurred in, in that part of the world, but we still need to find that out. Uh, that particular variant does seem to uh, uh, drive blondism uh, in different parts of the world, but because we have the frequency and the effect size very differently ascertained, then that variant would be a very poor predictor uh, from the UK Biobank to populations in Melanesia and vice versa. Uh, so to follow up uh, some of the work that we did um, uh, in, in the AGHG paper, uh, we took empirical data from a really wonderful uh, study called um, uh, the Population Architecture Using Genomics and Epidemiology, which is an NHGRI funded uh, consortium. Uh, and work from this study was published uh, last summer in Nature, and this work is led by um, Jen Wojcik. So this was a, a consortium uh, whose goal was to investigate ancestrally diverse populations across the Americas to, under, to gain a better understanding, not just of how genetic factors influence disease, but also how uh, genetic risk transfers across populations. And um, uh, at the time, this was one of the biggest studies that was ascertained uh, in non-European populations across the Americas. Uh, there was 17,000 African American, 22,000 Hispanic Latino, um, about 4,000 Native Hawaiian, uh, about 4,500 uh, Asian, actually Japanese ancestry populations, and then um, about 600 or so uh, Native Americans and others in this group. And uh, this was, data was um, also linked to um, over 200 traits and outcomes, but we focused our first uh, flagship paper on 26 of these, mainly um, traits and biomarkers underlying cardiometabolic conditions and some lifestyles and one or two diseases in there, for example, uh, type 2 diabetes. So um, using uh, methods that we built that allowed, allowed us to do a parsimon parsimonious joint um, analysis across populations together, and I won't go into it, but we had to do a lot of work actually because existing tools would not work out of the box. Um, we were able to do a very well calibrated uh, genome-wide association study for all these traits. Um, and uh, this uh, little uh, heat graph is showing you some of the results. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is even though at the time that we did this GWAS, there existed uh, GWAS in predominantly European populations for all of these traits and conditions, uh, usually five if not tenfold bigger in size, we still discovered about 26 novel loci. And unsurprisingly, that was because the loci that we discovered were either rare or absent in, non -Europe in European populations. But the other thing we were able to do was replicate um, about 1,400 known trait variant associations from predominantly European populations in the diverse populations of PAGE. And this really allowed us to dig into some of the questions around rec uh, rec replication of um, uh, genome-wide associations in diverse populations. So one of the first things is we looked at effect sizes across population groups. So this is looking at uh, standardized z-scores from uh, the page analysis in two of our biggest populations, the African-American and Hispanic Latino, compared to standardized effect sizes from predominantly European po uh, population uh, GWAS for the same conditions in the GWAS catalog. And what we discovered was the effect sizes across all loci in a mix of 26 conditions were attenuated in the non-European population. So 
In Hispanic Latino, the effect size was attenuated to 0.86 and even more so in African American populations. Now we couldn't rule out that there could be some uh, interplay of winner's curse going on here in the study design, but the fact that there's two different populations with different effects suggests that there is something more complicated going on. Now I certainly don't think that the biology or the causal variants um, are necessarily different. In fact, I think they're mostly shared, but really what I think is going on is the estimates of the effect size are different across the populations. So one of the nice ways we could follow this up is we could take the uh, 50,000 participants in page and do a, a meta-analysis and fine mapping um, of that data with a very large European ancestry study of height called GIANT. And we could compare that uh, to a similar meta-analysis, but just adding 50,000 more European uh, participants to the meta-analysis. And when we did this, we showed the posterior probability of a top-ranked SNP in any of the credible SNP uh, sets for um, almost 400 loci in that analysis were significantly higher uh, when you meta-analyze using diverse populations, even when the diverse populations are a very small percentage of the meta-analysis as a whole. And the reason for that is really shown here in this example, uh, where we zoom in on a particular locus uh, in both analyses, uh, where you see at the top the locus zoom of the signal uh, at that dot 1L locus. Um, the magnitude of the association is pretty similar. It's, it's a little uh, lower p-value in the uh, European meta-analysis compared to the page meta-analysis. Uh, so you get a slight um, improvement of signal. However, when you go down to try and understand what is the causal variance driving that signal in the middle row, you see that you have four variants that you have very poor power to discriminate between um, and in the European-only analysis versus <coughs> being able to discriminate with very strong signal, <coughs> excuse me, a single variant in the meta-analysis that includes diverse populations. And the reason for that is that LD between those four SNPs is uh, very strong in European populations and broken apart in African American and uh, Hispanic Latino populations. So now you have power to discriminate causality. Okay, so I'm going to uh, finish up with a few thoughts. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, there are now very many people who are working on this question of how you um, generalize uh, genomic risk predictions into um, not only diverse populations, but also into different age groups, into different uh, clinical or social contexts. And uh, to do this, I think we have to uh, consider what are the uh, issues that need to be explored further. So I mentioned already uh, linkage disequilibrium differences, uh, particularly when you are using, which is common in, in GWAS studies with array and imputed data, uh, when you're using non-causal uh, alleles to predict. But there are other technical things, uh, I think that, that many people have done nice work to show, including actually in the GIANT study, there was a great paper that show that there are some, uh, even when you're using best practices in the field to control for population stratification, residual population stratification can actually <coughs> bias uh, your risk prediction in the discovery population. Uh, even when you know the causal variant, for example, the, the um, TYRP1 variant I showed you, Allele frequencies and even effect size differences uh, can differ between populations. And of course, uh, there are often background uh, positive and negative selection at play. This tends to be thought of uh, as a fairly uncommon event in uh, human genomes relative to the types of uh, um, effect sizes associated with disease outcomes. However, in this era of thinking about genomic risk for thousands of diseases and traits uh, in many different populations, it crops up actually quite a lot and needs to be considered. And of course, uh, not only the genetic effects, but I think even more often the non-genetic effects at play uh, that are linked to our own demographic history that's extraordinarily complex um, and the environment and the societies we live 
live in uh, can really have an impact about our risk prediction and interpretation of risk. So in these early days, I think the evidence suggests that um, the relative quantitative contributions of these factors can really be condition or trait and population and context specific and highlighting that when we're thinking about uh, calibrating a polygenic risk in humans, uh, we ought to jointly consider these uh, complexities. So I'm going to end there um, and just uh, with a, a couple of thoughts um, as um, on some of the work that I showed. So, you know, cryptic relatedness as we really build bigger and bigger databases and particularly as those databases kind of um, migrate toward being more population based databases, the types you find in health systems. Um, or in biobanks, uh, then I think we're going to find more and more cryptic relatedness and it, they, they, it's going to explode as we uh, genotype or sequence more individuals. Um, and this can impact uh, prevalence for risk. It can point us to populations with specific risk and it can point you to how um, a genetic risk or, or, or protection is shared among people um, who could actually live in very different places in the world. And genomics, you know, it tells us about our susceptibilities to disorders and disease, but as a population geneticist, it can also reveal the broader story of our ancestry and our history and how that itself is correlated to social, environmental, and behavioral and uh, determinants of health. And often when we're using genomics to uh, look at population groups, what we're really controlling for is the environment rather than ge the genetics uh, to help us uncover uh, what are the important factors going on. Um, um, and then lastly, uh, to embrace opportunity in this field, I think we really need to embrace complexity and embrace diversity. Uh, I'm just going to finish up by thanking the people who led the work that I showed today. Uh, Dr. Gillian Belvin, who's an assistant professor in the Institute for Genomic Health, I led the work, the work on IBD. Uh, Sinead Kulina is a grad student who, led, who uh, contributed to the work on the PAGE project that was led by um, Jen Wojcik, who is now an assistant professor in Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Ruhi Shamarani uh, led the development of eyelash. Um, Alicia Martin led the work on PRS and diverse populations. And um, Christian Yu is a close collaborator on, on almost all of these uh, work, as is uh, Nora Abelhassan, who is the co-director of the Institute for Genomic Health. Uh, with that, I'll thank my page collaborators, thanks to the thousands of participants who make this work possible. And of course, uh, to uh, my uh, funders, many of which, uh, most, many of my grants supported by NHGRI. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenny, for an outstanding presentation, sharing all of your extensive work with us. It's so very informative. I know we are right at time, but I do want to take a couple questions that we received. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one. How do you generally approach issues around linking socially constructed race to genetic genomic indicators? And what are more scientifically, scientifically relevant ways to describe race? Um, what would your guidance be to people who are newly considering these types of concerns? Yeah, and I think that people are newly, not new, I mean, people have been considering these questions for decades, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it comes around in cycles again, and I think this is something that's really to the forefront of what a lot of people are considering, maybe even particularly how this relates to um, medicine and uh, how we use um, race or ethnicity as a variable in science and medicine. Um, so uh, I think that, um, you know, the, the answer is very nuanced because uh, we can use uh, genetic ancestry that maybe is uh, more of a proxy for our demographic history as a species and, and in different time frames, as I gave you two examples, more ancient time frames and more recent time frames. And that tells us um, that often tracks with uh, shared biology uh, by virtue of shared uh, genetic variation, um, which can be a, a very a good proxy for how we can think about a much more of a continuum of uh, population group, uh, not necessarily population 
population group, they're a continuum of, of uh, us on, um, uh, from, you know, from an individual level to a family level to populations to uh, our species. Um, however, I think that uh, uh, identity is a very nuanced and complex issue. And, um, and I think that information about identity, although it may be more linked to society and, and geography and uh, politics, um, it can also uh, track with um, uh, things that can be important for our health too, like for example, uh, healthcare access or um, uh, food uh, security. Um, and from a research perspective, that can be very important information if you're trying to learn how those factors um, impact people's health. Um, uh, but from a, a medical perspective, uh, maybe there's ways that we can come away from those groupings in arenas where it causes more harm to think about people that way. And we maybe could be more advanced and think about people um, uh, using, for example, uh, aspects of genetic ancestry uh, that might be more appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Another question is related to what environmental covariates do you have access to within Biome? And what are your aspirations for using genetic data to tease out the role of various environmental factors? Yeah, I mean, I, I confess this is new to me, so uh, I, I, but it's very exciting. Um, so from, because we're, um, uh, health systems data, we uh, can start to um, think about how we use uh, features of uh, both the exposome and epigenetic type biological markers, but also the types of information collected by local and state uh, governments and entities and institutes about the environment around us, or the built environment, the atmospheric environment, the cultural environment, and things like that. Uh, so uh, certainly not my expertise, but there's wonderful researchers in this space who have been thinking a lot about uh, what are the um, environmental components that really matter for specific outcomes. And uh, I think maybe genetics is a little new sometimes into this space, but we can bring a genetic layer in and think about um, modeling those things together or with other biological markers and um, uh, kind of increase the dimensions of the data that we're using to learn. I think we have to do that very thoughtfully and carefully um, and not overinterpret, but I think that um, certainly from a genetics perspective, it makes sense to me that this uh, is a big missing variable in, in much of the work that we do. And um, I have no doubt that we will uncover a lot of um, nuances of uh, uh, information for discovery. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. I know we are a couple minutes over time, so I just want to thank you so very much for your presentation today. And I want to thank everyone that joined us. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.